Joey Portuguese got an A plus with two bruised knuckles and a sweet nickname. He got started in East. The vulnerable and tired miners to compete for the miners' hard-earned money. The people to tend to be very superstitious. There's not much they have in the first place. The next year, in July 1781, the beloved woman Nanihi, or Nancy Ward, negotiated a peace treaty between her people and the Americans. North Carolina legislature established Green County out of Washington County lands. Western lands now have three counties, Washington, Sullivan, and Green. Approximately 18,000 people living in these three counties. A North Carolina Act was passed, declaring the land south of the Tennessee and Holston Rivers and south of the French Broad to the mouth of the Big Pigeon was reserved for the Cherokee Indians. About 100 white families were already living there. Great Britain signed formal treaty recognizing the independence of the colonies in 1783. The Cherokee rebuilt Trota by 1784, but it never recovered its former status. Ward continued promoting alliance and mutual friendship between the Cherokee and rebel colonists, helping negotiate the Treaty of Hopewell in 1785. After mustering out of service with the Virginia Colonial Militia, Colonel Gilbert Christian brought his family in 1772 to settle along Reedy Creek an area he had come to love from his 1769 exploration while in service. He moved his family to the mouth of Reedy Creek on the Holston River on what had become a large plantation. The 38-year-old Virginia Militia Lieutenant became leader of the Reedy Creek community and built a large mill above the Cascades of Boozy Creek. Soon other families followed and the village of Christianville sprang up. Tennessee's first teacher was Humphrey Hogan, a long hunter who could read but not write, and taught children how to read and cipher in this settlement. Colonel James King was born at Londonderry, Ireland in 1752. He was well educated and first settled in Montgomery County, Virginia in 1769, but was attracted by accounts of the beautiful and fertile valleys of the Holston. 
by purchase, entry, and condemnation, acquired about 50,000 acres of land in and around Bristol, Tennessee, and Virginia of the present day. He moved to what is now Bristol probably prior to 1774. He served in the Point Pleasant campaign in Captain Pauling's company of Botator troops. He also served in several battles during the Revolutionary War and was wounded at Guilford Courthouse. He was captured and escaped and rejoined his regiment and after some time resigned his commission then returned to his home near Bristol. But rather than deliver to the quartermaster a magnificent mare from which he had knocked a British officer, he subsequently rejoined his regiment and was at Yorktown when Cornwallis surrendered. He was a keen patriot, a man of considerable initiative and rendered valiant service to the colonies. He built an iron furnace near Sulphur Springs. This was the first iron furnace erected in the state of Tennessee. Associated with Colonel King in the operation of this iron furnace was William Blunt, first territorial governor of Tennessee, and the man for whom Bluntville, the county seat of Solon County, was named. They hauled the iron by wagon 25 miles to Kingsport and boarded a ship on the junction of the north and south forks of the Holston to transport at that point by water. A great part of the products of this furnace, iron and castings, found a market downstate. There was soon another furnace downstream and a little tributary right off the Holston below the Fort Patrick Henry Dam, today called Old Pactolus Iron Works, along the rocky opening of the Kendrick Creek Brook off the Holston parallel to the Rock Springs Branch stream. Some historians, while agreeing that Kingsport was named for a Mr. King, are inclined to think that this man was William King of Abingdon, owner of the salt works north of that town, rather than his cousin, Colonel James King. It is possible that the cousin's activities at the Little River Port may have been combined in giving Kingsport its name. It was being called Boatyard, naturally, but William King established King's Mill Station at the mouth of Reedy Creek in 1774, who later used the port of Boatyard extensively for the shipping of iron, bacon, salt, and other commodities to towns down the Holston and Tennessee rivers. In consequence of the heavy shipments, the mill station port became known as King's Port. The change of name from King's Boatyard to King's Port was because of the heavy shipments of salt from there by Mr. King who at that period owned and operated the salt works up in Virginia. Natives mostly lived in the surrounding valleys where game and water were plentiful. Bays Mountain may have occasionally been used for hunting or as a regional lookout for Sentinel Point, the end of the mountain where the radio towers stand today. The Watauga land purchase of 1775 transferred most of this region to white settlers, and by 1778, some land deeds had begun to reference Bays Mountain, the first official uses of the name. It could have been based on a large bay horse that was highly coveted after by the local natives in the region, and many times they tried to catch the great beast, but never succeeded. Once they found its carcass, they claimed to see its spirit roaming the mountain, so they called it Bays Mountain out of respect. There's also reports of a large black dire wolf that gets mistaken for a horse in the surrounding areas. This is supposedly a jet black wolf, not a gray wolf, though gray wolves have been out of the area for about a century. Findings dug by S.D. Dean also show East Tennessee has been home to many animals like porcupine, giant ground sloth, caribou, and elk. There were massive animals that were record-breaking size for the eastern part of the U.S., such as a 9-foot, 480-pound beaver, the size of a black bear, and a 450-pound jaguar, as well as an armadillo, three times larger than one found today. This cave is dry, and this fluke of nature helped form our history. Its namesake was found in 1811, the bones of a giant ground sloth that was probably washed into the cave by a prehistoric sea. The constant temperature and low humidity of this arid cave left the bones well preserved. 
but it was the soil itself that really allowed Bone Cave to make its mark in history. Apparently they were keeping records of the tribe, but I, I can't decipher, I can't say. These cave drawings are called petroglyphs and date back to the Mississippian Indians who lived in East Tennessee over a thousand years ago. There are other caves, such as Indian Cave in Granger County, that take us even further back in time. The remains of cane torches Indians used to light their way were sent to the Smithsonian Institution. They were judged to vary in age from 250 years after the time of Christ to less than 500 years ago, proving that Indians used this cave throughout history. In stoke marks, uh, are marks here in the wall that uh, was left when the Indian came through and he needed to knock the ambers off the end of his torch, not like knocking the ashes off of a cigarette. Indians were big cave explorers. I think uh, the caves intrigued them. Uh, plus, uh, they came into some of the caves looking for flint, for chert, to make tools out of. Torch material like this uh, was found all the way to the end of the cave over 5,000 feet back. The remains of an Indian who never found his way out were discovered in 1984. He died in the depths of the cave over 3,000 years ago. Up through this hole they found uh, parts of an Indian skeleton. The most prominent theory is that the Indian came in the cave perhaps longer than what he had planned on being and on his way back out uh, he had a problem and ran out of torch material or lost his torches, probably died of exposure and eventually washed down and washed into a mud bank. Inside a cave is a world that is constant. The temperature, humidity and darkness seldom vary. This stability protects the relics of our past. It is a time capsule where history is preserved. Unfortunately, many caves in Tennessee have been vandalized such as this, uh, destroying natural formations. They form at the rate of approximately a cubic inch every 100 to 150 years. So they're several thousands of years old. There could have at one time been uh, pet Indian petroglyphs in this cave that would now possibly be destroyed. He did cut his name on that, it looks like. At Warriors on the Lake, there were five found shell pits from 3000 BC to 1000 BC the natives used for their clam bakes, opening freshwater mussels and feasting, throwing the shells in there. There were 35 different types of mussel shells that lived in these rivers. Now they are all eradicated and no longer live there and only have invader species, no natural shell. There are around 350 archaeological sites in this region, and 65 of those were found in Patrick Henry Lake alone near Warriors when they dropped it for the first time in 1986. I did Sullivan County because I live there, and, and Washington County has 141 sites, prehistoric sites, has one or two. Uh, Hawkins County has three or 400 prehistoric sites. It's just... Uh, like I said, it's just so mind-boggling that I had to really focus in on a small particular, but that's pretty representative of what's here. You know what I mean? You could go Sycamore Shoals, the side that was dug there at the FUD site back in the 60s. It's early woodland, you know, just like some of the stuff I showed. But uh, yeah, there's sites, uh, there's a lot of sites in this area. I would say, I would say in Hawkins County and, and Sullivan County alone, there's probably 700, six, 700. We don't know. And then every day there's some construction going on, so you may lose two in a day. You ought to That's covered over and we don't even know about. What we've been hunting is the river bottoms and places that around water that we expect them to be. If all that was covered, how many sites are in the next upland that we aren't even looked at yet? I just do it as a hobby, as, as an advocate. What you're doing is just as important as what's being done here well, they're two different time periods. They've got a unique situation that's four and a half to seven million years old. There are no more. Mine is real late. They're 10, 20,000 years ago. And there's a lot more of those sites around. A shoreline survey in 2009 found in South Holston Lake that there were 32 new sites. There's plenty of room for a plethora of more findings, especially around Long Island. 
on the return of Holston and his party from the Natchez region, six years previous to the revolution. The restless spirit of Holston, or rumor of an Indian foray, led him to move with his family to Saluda Old Town on the Little Saluda in Upper South Carolina. He had not escaped Indian trouble. In the summer of 1753, a party of Cherokees raided his premises, nearly killed his wife and baby, and stole his horses and his pewter, dishes, and a kettle. About the time of the breaking out of Indian troubles in 1754, Holston removed to Culpeper County in Virginia, where he was still not free from Indians. In 1757, he was captured by them, but making his escape, he returned to the waters of the Holston in the bounds of Botetourt County, Virginia. Some records record that he was captured in 1734 and escaped in 1741. He saw service at the Battle of Point Pleasant on the Ohio in October 1774 as a member of the company of Captain Henry Pauling of Pothetort. Though somewhat advanced in years, he was in Colonel William Christian's campaign of 1776 against the Cherokees and crossed his river over Long Island. In January 1781, Holston was a captain in the Revolutionary Service. His detachment crossed Dan River and joined Nathaniel Green at Battle of Haw River in North Carolina, nicknamed Pyle's Massacre or Pyle's Hacking Match, for good reason. Holston was also at the Battle of Guilford Courthouse, March 15, 1781, as one of the 2,253 Virginians who participated. He resigned as captain of the militia the following year, and stories of his adventures in the wilderness along this course of water deemed him honorable enough in the naming of the river. The study it by now. Uh, the human burials. Y'all want me to continue or? Okay. Uh, the human burials. Uh, okay. 